that's the main focus of my research interest. So um, disorders of consciousness are very, very common in acute brain injury and or following acute brain injury. And um, we know relatively little about these. And they are very important in decision-making what, so for example, patients, uh, families decide about the goals of care in, in, in their loved ones. It is very important for us to understand more about what are the underlying mechanisms and what is the trajectory of these patients with disorders of consciousness. Uh, traditionally, how we examine them is just by going to the bedside and, you know, like we are talking now, you interact with a patient and you're trying to determine whether the patient has a disorder of consciousness. Basically, um, by the response that you get, you determine what level of consciousness there is. Typically, we ask them to do little things like, you know, sticking out their tongue or, you know, things like that. And so um, that had been the, basically, the way that we did things. And then more recently, a number of studies have sort of challenged that notion. And uh, we did a study in 2019 where we connected patients that were unresponsive and were not interacting with the examiner to EEG. And we found that when we had headphones on for them and played commands, so for example, we asked them, open and close your right hand. And then, you know, we said, stop opening and closing your right hand. And we did this over and over again. We recorded the EEG during it, that we found that 15% of the patients actually had distinctly different responses to the move versus the stop moving command. So on some level, they were actually able to comprehend this command. And even though, you know, when you stand there and you look at them, they don't respond at all. And so this was quite mind blowing. This uh, sort of built on work that Erin Owen did, uh, published in Science in 2006, where he had a patient, a young woman, who had a traumatic brain injury and was um, in a vegeta what we called vegetative state or unresponsive wakefulness syndrome for months. And he put, connected, uh, put, put her into an MRI scanner, and he was able to show that she activated two commands, two certain um, you know, things that he said, the same areas in the brain in the functional MRI scan compared to a, uh, to a healthy volunteer. And so this started this whole interest. Is there more than what we can determine by just looking at a patient? And so we found that that's actually also very uh, quite common in uh, acute brain injury in the intensive care unit. Why is that important there? Because based on what we find on examination, what we find in our tests, we talk about the prognosis. And if patients you know, are actually potentially awake on some level, our question was, does that tell us something about the prognosis? And we found that you know, those patients that had the activation had a much higher chance to have a good functional outcome a year later compared to those that did not. So it may be able to more better prognosticate the recovery. In addition to prediction, so there's a ton we don't understand about this yet. And um, my group and my lab and a number of others are working on trying to shed light on that. But in addition to that, what the goal is, is then to sort of promote the recovery, to not just predict, but to somehow find ways to promote and support the recovery. And that's where a lot of, you know, the effort of research is also going towards. What is likely going to be needed is not sort of like, let me say, like the wonder drug, one drug that works for everybody, because depending on what, in some way, what's broken in this circuit, you may need different interventions. And so there are ways of, for example, electrically stimulating certain parts of the brain to support recovery um, or to support an improvement in the examination. There's medical ways of doing that, for example, with the mantidine um, and other uh, medications. But there are many, many different uh, sort of um, opportunities that we have. But we have to sort of, in some ways, better phenotype the patients with a disorder of consciousness to then find the best treatment for that individual patient, if that makes sense.